you poor people. Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming by. Uh, I'd like to talk to you today about a project I did with a friend of mine, a paperback publishing imprint called Hard Case Crime. Uh, in 2003, I was working as a creative director and writing novels at night. And I had a friend named Charles Ardai who had founded an ISP called Juno, and he was writing mystery stories at night. Uh, so shortly after he sold Juno to a bigger firm, I took him out for his birthday to a Japanese restaurant near Grand Central. And I said, you're out of a job now, and you have a few dollars in your pocket. What do you want to do next? And he said, I want to bring back the old gold medal paperbacks. So, in case you don't know about gold medal, it started with this. This is James Watt's patented steam engine, circa 1769. Uh, it not only kicked off the Industrial Revolution, but it paved the way for the first steam locomotives. By the middle of the 19th century, rail travel was common, and for the first time, large numbers of people were regularly traveling long distances, and they all needed something to read. So soon, each railway station had a newsstand like this, where you could buy a newspaper, or a magazine that looked something like this. But as chromolithography gave way to offset printing at the turn of the century, magazines started looking like this. It was the heyday of the old pulp magazines. They had magazines cover catering to all different tastes. There were Western, romance, adventure, war stories, and crime. Uh, I have a real soft spot for this one, particularly the guy in the foreground who was blasting away with a 45 with one hand and examining forensic evidence under a microscope with the other. Uh, I would say he's, he's the complete package. Uh, anyway, it was a big market and people were looking for other ways to exploit it. And eventually somebody thought, what if you took popular novels and reprinted them as small books using newspaper presses and cheap newsprint? Uh, please and sold them like magazines at newsstands, rotating them regularly so they were always new and exciting. Uh, please note the series title if you can read it, Routledge Railway Library. Paperback, uh, paperbacks themselves are not new. Books have been published in paper covers since the late Renaissance, but this was a new approach. Small sizes, low prices, low production quality, high quantity, and unorthodox distribution channels. In Germany, you had Reclam and Tauschnitz, and later, in the 1930s, you had Albatross. And then, just a few year la years later, in the UK, Penguin Books. Uh, it was launched just a bit after the highly successful Albatross imprint. And oddly enough, it had exactly the same page size, the same color-coded covers, the same order form included inside, and even a seabird mascot centered at the bottom of the cover. Alan Lane, publishing visionary. Uh, Penguin inspired pocketbooks in the U.S. in 1939, who are said to have pioneered the use of revolving wire racks. Uh, this was Pocketbook's first title, and like the whole line, it was hugely successful. And this led to the way for a flood of books from other publishers who wanted to get in on the new paperback boom. You'll notice here many of the same visual strategies developed for the pulps, but stripped down typo with stripped-down typography and sometimes a bit of formal experimentation. Uh, one early U.S. pulp magazine publisher in the U.S. was Fawcett, whose flagship title was a humor magazine named for the publisher and a type of high explosive shell, and they wanted a piece of all this. In 1945, they signed a deal with New American Library to distribute their mentor and signet titles in paperback, and this contract prohibited Fawcett from publishing their own paperback reprints. But Fawcett had an idea for getting around this. What if you published original paperbacks, books that had never been done before in hard covers? And to do this, in 1949, they launched Gold Medal. Uh, gold Medal is generally credited for inventing paperback originals, or PBOs. Uh, and that's not strictly true. But it was the first publishing imprint devoted to them exclusively. And they remained a leader in the field for a quarter century. Uh, the idea behind this new kind of paperback is that it would be sold like magazines. There would be no bookseller to recommend it. Uh, there would be no rev reviews to get the word out, and no big name authors. You'll notice that the author names here are often very small. Richard Prather would be an exception. He was a star back then. 
but Day Keen and Leonard Prin are fairly eensy. Um, and, uh, sorry, the covers had to sell themselves the way pulp magazines did. And they used the same tools, intense color, bold design, violence, and sex. Uh, before I go any further, I should probably say a few words about paperback originals and the representation of women. Uh, these books were made by men for other men, and the covers are all about the male gaze. Uh, the women in these books, or the best of them, are often complex and impressive. The women on the covers are not. At one point, I tried to do a taxonomy of PBO cover imagery, but I had to give up because it wound up looking something like this. <laughs> the women were there to be decorative and to make men want to take the books out of those revolving wire racks and carry them to the cashier, and I'm not going to try to defend this. Uh, but I will say that Western civilization throughout history has been a fairly racist, sexist affair, and that art made in that kind of a society will necessarily be encoded with different kinds of bigotry including sexual victory. If you love the art, you try to work around it. And we loved this stuff. Uh, these covers were produced in-house by anonymous art directors with massive workloads and limited collections of type. And the speed with which they were designed and their single-minded focus on selling gave them a certain vigor. They were not lukewarm. They were not careful. They were not beige. Uh, some of them were beautifully painted and designed, and some of them were terrible in interesting ways. There was a lot of formal experimentation. Uh, this is a lovely Robert McGinnis painting, and we are going to be hearing from him later on. Uh, and some of them were just nuts. And some were, some were really, uh, uh, sorry, uh, do, do, do we need a bit more of that? <laughs> okay, right. And some were very stylish. Um, we also love uh, another Robert McGinnis. We also love the books as objects. Uh, they were laminated with acetate, sealed with cellulose varnish. They had a soft, satiny sheen. And the newsprint, page, uh, newsprint, pr newsprint pages uh, in the old days would yellow very, very quickly. And the books wouldn't look fresh on the rack. So to counteract this and to give them more shelf appeal, they were usually tipped in brilliant colors. And with age, these colors become very rich and subtle, and they have a wonderful velvety feel and a sweet smell. And the fact is, even if you're a modernist, and in my professional life as a designer, I am pretty much a modernist, sometimes you need a break from this. We really loved these books. So, Charles and I started to talk about it, and a plan for the new gold medal began to take shape. We would focus on hard-boiled fiction. We would publish new writers, but also the best of the old. No Hammond and Chandler or other famous hard-boiled writers who were still in print, but Day Keen and David Dodge and Wade Miller and other writers who had done a few strong books and were now forgotten. Our books would look like the old ones. We'd get brilliant painters to do painterly old-school covers. We'd tip the pages in bright yellow to match the redesigned gold medal mark, We'd make them rack size and skinny like the old ones, which would let us sell them really cheap. And this would get us a lot of attention and promote impulse buying. The books would have crossover appeal. There'd be something for mystery fans, something for hipsters, and something for the genre buyers at Walmart. Now, all this raised certain questions of authenticity, of homage versus pastiche, of appropriation. Would we be making a Disney-ish Disney theme park facsimile of the past? We wanted them to be a bit cheesy, but would they be the wrong kind of cheesy? We figured we'd sort all that out as we went along. The point was we had an idea we loved, and we thought we had a pretty good idea of how we could make it work. Then we began to look into the matter a bit more closely. In 1982, Gold Medal was acquired by Ballantine Books, a division of Random House, and Random House was not interested in licensing the name. Improvements of paper in paper in the late 20th century made it unnecessary to hide yellowing edges with colored dyes, and since some of the dyes involved were toxic, very few printers offer the service anymore. 
The new polypropylene films and UV cured liquid laminations were tough and plasticky and they produced a very high gloss. We tried matte lamp, but that killed the colors. We found that genre buyers at Walmart are not interested in uh, old stuff. They want things to be new and shiny. And we found that in, in spite of all this, you couldn't do anything that you couldn't put on the shelves at Walmart's. Uh, no paperback distributor would touch a books that might offend Walmart shoppers, some of whom were very conservative heartland Christians. This introduced us to the concept of implied nudity. Here you see a cover that was perfectly acceptable in 1966, but because of implied nudity, Walmart would not sell it today. You see, even though we can't see Modesty Blaze's breasts, those guys can. <laughs> and that means it's no go. Nobody wants to buy a skinny book. People don't feel they're getting enough to read. And no one wants to sell a cheap book because uh, booksellers are not interested in 40% of a $4 book. It's not worth their time to shelve it or inventory it. And the audience for mass paperbacks is aging and younger readers do their reading on screen. Our first publisher, Dorchester, went bankrupt in 2012. Our new publisher, Titan in the United Kingdom, uh, basically will not do our books rack size except in very special cases. Now, we obviously did not know all this in 2003 and 4, but we were learning more every day. And most of what we learned was not encouraging. We decided to go ahead anyway. So, it was time to go to work. Neither of us remember who came up with the name Hard Case Crime. Uh, but I remember we liked the yellow ribbon because it was in the tradition of the medals, crests, and seals you saw for the old PBO publishers who wanted to give their cheap, shoddy products a touch of class. And we wanted to be able to say this. We call this the motto box, and it appears on all of our books. The mismatched typefaces are part of the point. We mismatched a lot of typefaces, just like the old guys with limited typecases and limited time. Uh, the uh, blobby lettering uh, and graphics were a nod to the old photostats, which is how you carried logos around before .a, fi a files. A good photostat is a beautiful, sharp thing. Uh, but once you make a photostat of the photostat and then make stats of those, it starts to get soft and blobby, and that's the look we wanted. Uh, we bled the colophon off the top edge in the upper left corner, just like the old gold medals. And I do want to say one last word about the colophon. I was doing a hard case in part to take a break from modernism, but it's hard to stop being a modernist once you've started, and the logo is built on a grid. <laughs> now, in the 1930s, when the visual language of cheap American paperbacks was being established, one of the key things the publishers wanted was to look new and exciting. Now, what was new and exciting in the 1950s, uh, 1930s? Well, this was pretty new and exciting. The Bauhaus opened up a lot of possibilities, uh, a symmetry, angle type, and a break from the tyranny of the central axis. And they used a lot of 19th century jobbing faces, grotesques, and some slab serif types. And so did we. The other thing that was still pretty new and exciting was the talkies. Uh, the main source for PBO tropes and strategies was the pulse, but the new breed of movie poster was also an influence. You saw a greater influence, uh, willingness to mix it up with asymmetrical and angled type and lettering and a bolder use of montage, which was another favored mode for Bauhaus, gra Bauhaus graphics. The types we chose included these new modern slab serifs that uh, Gatschikolt liked so much. and one didone, which was especially popular because it was bold and narrow enough to make a strong showing on a small cover. Uh, when it came to Bauhaus influenced Sanzes, this was of course the big daddy, uh, especially the bold condensed version, which was, it came very close to being the default PBO typeface. Uh, there were also the modern interpretations of the old jobbing grotesques. This was a very early super family uh, when ATF was uh, put together out of, I think, 23 other type foundries, they had an immense catalog of numbered grotesques, completely miscellaneous and random, 
and Morris Fuller Bentley was tasked with organizing them into some kind of a usable and coordinated large family. Franklin Gothic was an early, uh, was an early effort in this direction. Trade Gothic was Atlantotype, was uh, under, uh, done al along similar lines. Uh, alternate Gothic was another such effort. Um, and we did uh, use one late entrant. Uh, even though this was designed in 1994, it had the same uh, purpose uh, and the same spirit as the old, uh, as the old uh, grotesque superfamilies, and it also came in a really useful range of uh, weights and widths. Now, the interiors of the book were brutally simple, uh, uh, like the originals. In the old days, something as interesting as this uh, would be an exception. This is an armed services edition. Uh, soldiers have carried paperbacks in the rucksacks in the Civil War and every war since. And uh, in the Second World War, the US government distributed free armed forces editions, uh, armed services edition for soldiers. Uh, they were printed landscape in two columns so they could fit into a uniform breast pocket and they were meant to be thrown away after one reading. But mostly the interiors were crude functional affairs, uh, single column center axis meant to shoehorn copy into the smallest, skinniest books possible. We did think it would be nice if we picked a handsome face for headlines and chapter numbers. And uh, I think you'll agree this is a pretty good one. Uh, we also needed body copy. So um, the obvious choice would have been Times Roman which uh, then as now is, uh, was omnipresent after its uh, introduction into the US market in 1942. Uh, the problem was that uh, we had the opposite problem than the old guys. We had to pad out old 50,000 word quickies into a marketable size. So while space saving times would have been, would have been an obvious choice, uh, we needed something more expansive. And uh, we settled on Caledonia, tracked out a bit to make it look more like metal. It added 12% to the lengths of our books. And a lot of the time we needed that. Uh, so here's how the title pages turned out. And here's the text page. Old paperback originals did not usually use end slugs, but they sometimes did. And we had fun designing this one and using it. And here's some of the back ads. I'm, uh, I'm kind of proud of the fact that we made the URL look just a little bit pirated. Uh, the spines were easy. The old spines were often, most often plain white with red and black type, and that's what we did. This also had the advantage of standing out on the shelf since these days most spines are colored. Uh, as far as the back covers are concerned, the main thing in the old days was speed. You just couldn't spend much time on them, and often you didn't have much to say because the PBOs weren't blurbed. Our approach was to set up a simple, one approach was to set up a simple standard text-only template with a simple border and use it for everything. Um, the other approach was to just knock something out at random for each title and not worry too much about it. And we kind of liked the sound of that. That's the way we decided to go. Uh, one thing we did consider was color. Um, back in the old days, if you wanted to use composed colors, every uh, CMYK tint uh, that you added was a separate, a separate uh, zinc block from the engraver, and that cost money, and you didn't want to spend money. So you focused on simple colors that needed one or two blocks and still had a lot of impact. And these are the colors you saw everywhere. So we didn't limit ourselves to this, but we focused on these. And here's how one of our covers, back covers, turned out. Uh, it's got a beautiful painting there by Michael Kelsch. And here's another. This was actually Mickey Spillane's last novel, unfinished at his death. We convinced the estate to let us finish it and publish it. Uh, we had one of our best authors do it, and that is a beautiful Robert McGinnis painting. Uh, once again, more about him later uh, on the front. Uh, even though most back covers were kind of nothing in the old PBO's, PBO days, there was one uh, Notable exception, uh, the old Dell mapbacks who did beautiful diagrams and illustrations um, of the settings of the novels on the back. And uh, we were very 
happy when we got a chance to do one of our own. And that uh, illustration is done by a wonderful map maker and illustrator we found called Susan Hunt Yule. Okay, very often when people try to emulate a hard boiled style, uh, you get something like this. And that's how you know the designer has no idea what a PBO looks like. Uh, the Indiana Jones logo was based on old pulp magazine nameplates like these. And by the way, if you think women were poorly treated in the old pulp magazines, you should see the treatment people of color got. Uh, this kind of work with outlines, drop shadows, and gradients generally was way too labor intensive for a single PBO title. You could only afford to do this if you were going to amortize your investment over the course of a few years. Uh, so we did not use this sort of thing for, for cover treatments. Uh, the kinds of cover treatments we uh, looked at were these. Uh, this is the most common kind of title treatment, and it was also the most basic. It was a bold, condensed sans. Uh, the cover on the right uh, was a common format for series books like uh, the ones for Shel Scott and Mike Shane, uh, and we will be getting back to it later. So um, this approach was simple, safe, and generally effective, and it usually meant someone was in a hurry. Uh, another approach, uh, the second commonest approach was a slap serif. And uh, I would say this had a similar rationale. Uh, also, a lot of art directors would attempt script because scripts are uh, sort of dynamic. But this is difficult because, uh, you know, they weren't sending these jobs out to Tommy Thompson. And most in-house art directors then as now couldn't letter very well. So you'll notice the one on the right, which looks a bit nicer, is actually type. Uh, this one, the one on the right, uh, it looks a little nicer, but it, it could almost be announcing a spring sale at Von Witt Teller. Uh, so uh, this, at any rate, was another characteristic style. And the thing that's always struck me about it is that it seems filled with a bizarre kind of enthusiasm. Uh, an extremely popular style was this sort of distorted off-kilter approach, which I think was pretty attractive to most art directors because it didn't seem to take much skill, but it still gave you a kind of hip jazzy look. Uh, and the message here was that the book on offer was pretty wild, maybe with a whiff of marijuana. Then there was the horror movie look. And stencil, which was trendy back then too. Uh, but in those days, stencil had a much more earnest feel. And it signaled that the book was going to deal with a very important societal problem. Uh, calligraphic titles, or rather calligraphy inflected titles, were reserved for books with some pretension to quality. Um, it helped if they had historical settings or were in some way exotic to American readers. And lastly, a Bouncy Didon suggested that this book was hot stuff. When it came time to commission the cover illustrations, we discovered one more fact of life. There's a smaller supply of skilled realistic painters these days. The rise of photography and Photoshop have made it harder for illustrators to survive, and art schools these days are not so focused on life drawing and painting. So our first thought was, let's begin by talking to some of the great old guys. Uh, in most cases, this was not practical. <laughs> of the guys that were still alive when we launched Hard Case, James Avadi had lost his sight and stopped painting, and his good friend Stanley Meltzoff has also basically retired. We talked to... Robert McGuire, who was wonderful at a convention, and he very sadly said, you wouldn't want me these days. I'm just not that good anymore. And we uh, couldn't get through to Mitchell Hooks. That left one guy. He hadn't painted a paperback cover in a couple of decades, but he was possibly the finest painter of them all. He had been called the king of paperbacks, and he was the last man standing. 
Uh, most people know him for painting this gal and this guy. We were very happy when he agreed to be part of Hard Case. Uh, I found a painter called Greg Manchus. He's an illustrator with a closet full of gold and silver Society of Illustrators medals, and uh, we could not come close to affording his rate. But he liked what we were doing, and he liked the fact that we pretty much got, gave him carte blanche. Uh, and Glenn Orbeck was basically a comic book cover artist, but he seemed to have the right spirit. And in the end, he became more than anyone else the visual mainstay of the line. He did over two dozen covers for us, and many of them are among the strongest ones we've done. And I wish we could say we were still working with him. Uh, but earlier this year, he succumbed to cancer at the age of 52. He was a great artist, a complete pro, and a lovely man to work with. And we will miss him. We could not have done the line as it is without him. The one spark of brightness in all this is that his wife, Laurel Blechman, is also a very fine painter. And at the very end, when he was too sick to fulfill his last commission, she stepped in and she did it for him. I can't show it to you now because it hasn't been released yet, but it's gorgeous. And we, uh, she's working on her second hard case commission now. And we hope for a very long partnership with her. So here's a few of the books themselves. Um, I want to talk briefly about Fade to Blonde, not just because I wrote it, uh, but because there's a little bit of a story behind it. Um, I am or was a novelist, but I didn't get into this to write a novel. I got into this as someone interested in the design. But uh, when I was working out the cover uh, issues, I needed, I needed a title and a tagline and you know a name to use just for sample covers and you know we weren't doing Dashiell Hammett I'm not going to do the Maltese Falcon so I just made this up Fade to Blonde she was a little taste of heaven and a one-way ticket to hell and I made up a pulp writer <laughs> thank you thank you it's still in print it's still in print uh, and I made up a pulp writer uh, named Forrest DeVoe Jr. anyhow I was working on this one night and I thought oh, this is kind of interesting I wonder how it would be if somebody actually wrote a book with this title and this tagline. So I opened up Word, and I began making a few notes. At 8 o'clock the next morning, I had a first chapter, and it was time to go to my day job. And uh, so that's how I got started writing Fade to Blonde, which won us our first Chamis Award. And it was a lot of fun. I did it at a 2000 day, uh, word uh, a day clip like the old guys, not letting myself stop and revise, and that was really nice. Okay, here's a book by Samuel Fuller with psycho jazzy lettering. Here's some murderific lettering uh, for a novel called False Negative. Um, here, uh, if you remember the old Mike Shane series look, we always wanted to do one of those, and we finally got the opportunity to do that for our own Max Allen Collins, who has published God knows how many books with us at this point. Um, and we reprinted some of his early ones in a series like this with an old Robert McGinnis illustration. Uh, Carl and Ellison. Uh, there were a number of the old science fiction guys who used to write whatever people would pay them to write. Um, and uh, this is an early street punk, you know, uh, novel from the... Uh, 50s with a beautiful Glenn Orbit cover. Uh, this is rejected uh, lettering for our uh, second Stephen King original novel. Uh, the sales force said, what the hell is that? And I said, this novel has a carnival theme. And this is old carnival show card style lettering. And they said, Stephen King never has brush lettering. I like that. And I said, well, maybe now he can. He said, how will people know it's the same Stephen King? <laughs> <sighs> Go argue with a publishing salesperson. OK, some modified horror-esque for Madison Smart Bell. Some classy calligraphy for Gore Vidal, who also 
when he was young and struggling, did a pot boiler, a, uh, a crime novel with an exotic locale, and another beautiful Glen Orbit painting. And this was actually James M. Cain's last novel, also unpublished. And we worked for years to let the estate, uh, to, we worked for the years on the, uh, on the estate before they would let us clean it up a bit and publish it because it, he was very far gone at that point and it just wasn't very good. We uh, thought there was good stuff in it though and it was James M. Cain. So uh, we cleaned it up a bit and shooed it out the door. Um, in order to do this uh, one, uh, the editor sent me pics of mid-century cocktail bar signage and that was, that was the reference I used. We never got to revive gold medal, but we did get to revive some of their books. Branded Woman, another great Glen Orbit painting, one of our favorites. Uh, Stop This Man, Robert McGinnis. Another McGinnis for The Girl with the Long Green Heart. She had a grifter's soul. Uh, a Touch of Death, Charles Williams. Lovely puff ch ch Chuck Pyle cover. And this is interesting, Kill Now, Pay Later. Robert Turrell is Robert Kyle's real name. And uh, these are two Robert McGinnis paintings for the same title, 50 years apart. Uh, Michael Crichton, when he was in, he paid his way through med school by writing one thriller a year under an assumed name. And we got his estate to let us have those. This one's called Binary. Another Glen Orbit. Plunder of the Sun with a beautiful Bob McGinnis. And uh, Say It With Bullets by the guy who, uh, this is serious stuff, do, do you mind? Uh, by the guy who uh, created the Pink Panther. Uh, this is a comic novel and we thought it would be okay if we made the cover a little extra camp. And Baby Mole, which, I mean, aside from the title, what do you need? You also have another Bob McGinnis here. And I should point out that I, uh, a few of these, including this one, uh, uh, were uh, designed by Steve Cooley. Uh, I took a hiatus from the line uh, in the, uh, for a few years uh, because I was kind of maxed out on time. And uh, Steve Cooley of Cooley Design Lab stepped in and did some beautiful covers like this in the style uh, that, uh, the house style that we had set up. So, uh, we have to date published uh, over 100 books. And we have uh, published some authors I never thought we'd get anywhere near, along with Stephen King and Gore Vidal. Uh, we have Watergate conspirator e, conspirator e. Howard Hunt, who, believe it or not, actually started out as a very good hard-boiled crime novelist. Robert Block, Lawrence Block, James M. Cain, Pete Hamill, Reichel Crichton, Mickey Spillane, Cornell Woolrick, and like I said, uh, there were a few uh, science fiction guys who started out doing a bit of crime to pay the bills. Roger Zelazny, Robert Silverbill, and A.C. Doyle, whom you may know best as Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, our original novels have won awards, including two Seamus Awards and an Edgar, and people have said some very kind things about them. This came from an actual paper letter that Mickey Spillane wrote us shortly before his death. Uh, those questions of authenticity and appropriation have still not been resolved. All I can say for sure is that we really, really wanted to do these books. And we did them. And people seem to like them. Some people really, really like them. Thank you.